Welcome to Fine Keys Theological Tantrums. I am Fanny LaRue. This is the second video on my first thesis on women in the church. The thesis name, an evaluation of the theological message of Paul as it relates to the role of women in the church today. We carry on at section four. A response to alleged weaknesses of Paul's theological message as it relates to the role of women in the church today. To start this section, I shall first have to again look at the meaning or look into the meaning of Galatians 3 verse 28 as it is disputed. Then I shall respond to the fact that Jesus chose only men as apostles. After this, I shall respond to the headship issue. This will require me to look at the meaning of Jesus being the head or men being the heads of the church. Last, I shall briefly respond to the possible charge of tra trajectory hermeneutics and church history regarding the Bible in the discussion on the role of women in the church. 4.1 The meaning of Galatians 3 verse 28 Grudem and Johnson states that the context of Galatians 3 verse 28 is only justification by faith, not church government and church leadership. Grudem's point is that I, when I say it means that women can perform any role in the church, am misusing the text as it does not relate to women's role in the church. However, I believe that though justification through faith is the main theme through Galatians 3, the fact that 3 verse 26 says we, all believers, are sons of God, NKJV and NIV, and 3 verse 29 says we are heirs according to the promise, points to more than just justification. Rather, it points to all that Christ's death and resurrection entails, including all believers belonging to a new creation. Hendrickson. Yes, we are justified by faith and not by law, as Grudem points out. But Galatians 3 verse 26 to 29 then shows that believers are now something else because of this. Again, in Ephesians, the whole letter, but especially Ephesians 1 to 3, especially 2 verse 14 to 16, Paul goes to great length to show that Christians are a new creation and that Jews and Gentiles are one. Go ahead and stop. One cannot separate this from Galatians 3 verse 28. As Paul says, we are all sons and heirs. 3 verse 26, 29. Therefore, we believers are part of a new nation which consists of neither Jew nor Greek or Gentile, neither slave nor free, and then neither male nor female. Grudem states that unity does not mean we have the same roles. The problem with this is that Galatians 3 verse 28 say there is neither male nor female. To use an animal example, if I say three animals that, of three animals that the third is neither a horse nor a donkey, can I then say that this just means that they do not have the same roles? Or can I, we say that there should be no sense of pride and superiority or jealousy and inferiority between the horse and the donkey, if I use Grudem's words against it. The words neither nor themselves say that you have something different, not the horse and not a donkey. The roles of what you have, are they not subject to the differences of the roles of what you had before? For believers, any role that any believer would have to fulfill is dependent on the gifts that 
Christ. Ephesians 4 verse 7 to 8 and the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12 verse 4 and others, give. Not on gender, which in the new creation is irrelevant. Section 4.2 The apostles were all men. Grudem and Kostenberger says that if Jesus wanted to, he could have chosen six men and six women as apostles. As Jesus never hesitated to do culturally unpopular things when they were morally right. That's Grudem. Grudem also states that the fact that all the apostles were Jewish is irrelevant, as the whole early church was Jewish. And when the Gentiles did become part of the church, some of them, all men, became elders and teachers. He goes on to say that because the twelve foundations in the New Jerusalem had the names of the twelve apostles written on them, Revelation 21 verse 14, it establishes for all eternity, quote, that was the quote, that men are to hold the highest leadership positions in the church. He also points to Luke as example of a Gentile writing two of the New Testament books, probably under Paul's authorization. See also the soul. As pointed out earlier, section 3, Jesus had to be, number one, a Jew, and number two, a Jewish man, in order for him to fulfill God's salvation plan. Jesus came first to the Jews, and his mission began with the Jews. Matthew 15, verse 24 to 26, Acts 1, verse 8. I argue that these apostles, 12 plus 1, Paul, therefore also had to be Jewish men, because they had to be circumcised in order for them to have been able to enter the temple with Jesus, to have been afforded the teaching opportunities in the synagogues, and to have been listened to by the learned Jews. Add to this that except for Paul, all had traveled with Jesus for at least or at least witnessed his appearances after his, his resurrection. 1 Corinthians 9 verse 1. Grudem. Which no Gentile did. My point is that the apostles, like Jesus, lived under the old covenant, born and circumcised. Paul also, as he grew up a Jew. Galatians 1 verse 13 to 14. Their Jewishness was not inconsequential. It was essential and will be to judge Israel. Matthew 19 verse 28. When citing Matthew 19 verse 28, Grudem gives evidence for the case that the apostles had to be Jewish men. Also, the 12 plus 1 are the apostles, not all men. They are not every man. And if Grudem may use realized eschatology, then I may counter with Jesus saying that at the resurrection, all his children, both male and female, will be like angels in heaven. Matthew 22, verse 23 to 33. And also we find in Revelation 5, verse 10, that they will reign on the earth. I have to add to this that Paul said in, to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 1 to 3, that the Lord's people will judge the world. Are only the Christian men included in these cases? What is established is that Christ will reign or rule for eternity and all Christians with him. Section 4.3 The Headship of Christ and Man The meaning of the word kephale is disputed. Does kephale mean source or person in authority over? Grudem, uh, as Grudem asks. Little and Scott did provide source as origin or origin as one meaning. Now, Grudem showed that there was later an amendment to this. Lower Nida, on the other hand, says it is in view of authority to order or command. One who is superior to and one who is supreme over. On this issue, when Paul says in Ephesians 5, verse 23 to 24, that a husband is the head of his wife and Christ is the head of the church, and adds in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 3 that God is the head of Christ, how the nice and Foster and von Rainsburg agree with Grudem. That kephale means someone with authority over. 
therefore agreeing, agreeing with Fulf Lowen Nida's interpretation. When I read how Jesus spoke of and to the Father and of his will, especially in the Garden of Gethsemane, Matthew 26, verse 39 and 42, but also John verse 5, John 5, verse 20, 6, verse 27 and 37, and others, I have to agree with this meaning. Kephala means someone with authority over. Both Grudem and Ortland uses the fact that number one, Adam was made first, Genesis 2, verse 7, 18 to 23. Two, Adam represents humans, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22, and 44 to 45. Number three, Adam named Eve, Genesis 2, verse 23, Grudem. To show that male headship was God ordained and created before the fall. But Grudem also then uses Colossians 3, verse 18 to 19, to say that Christ restored this creation order. In the previous section, I have already started to discuss this issue. The question now is whether all men are heads, are the head or heads of all women. And if all men are the head or heads, the leaders of the church. First, Adam, who is represented man, is dead. He is not the head anymore. Now men are the heads of their respective families. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 3, Ephesians 5 verse 22 to 33, and Colossians 3 verse 18 to 19. Are all emphatic that wives must be subject to their own husbands, not all women, to all men. Chaldonais, Foster von Rensburg. Note that Rapa say that 1 Corinthians 11 verse 3 is not clear on whether Paul meant man and woman or husband or wife. But now we must note that 1 Corinthians 14 verse 34 to 35, which clearly is addressed to married women, Rapa, is used to say all women must be silent. When as Grudem interprets it, prophecies are being judged because he not only does not believe that 1 Corinthians 14 verse 34 should be understood in the light of 14:35, but the opposite, he also believes that unmarried women must ask other men in their families if they have questions. Both Grudem and Kostenberger bring 1 Timothy 2 verse 13 in here to justify the above, with the latter Kostenberger stating, it is because a woman by herself is particularly vulnerable to Satan's temptation. Therefore, Grudem adamantly disagrees with Rapa and Foster and von Rainsburg and others that Paul must have written 1 Corinthians 14 verse 34 to 36 for very specific circumstances, possibly to prevent husbands and wives from entering into public disagreements about interpretations of prophecies. And then Paul states, also states in 1 Timothy 3 verse 1 to 7 that elders, the heads of the churches, must be men. Grudem and Saucy explain that the church is viewed as a family. For example, we are children of God, Ephesians 5 verse 1 and others. And therefore, the family is the example for the church, and the church must imitate family patterns. Therefore, just as the head of a family is a man, so the head of the church, in Grun's view, every church must be men. However, Paul goes on to say that an elder must be husband of one wife. 1 Timothy 3 verse 2, And if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? 3 verse 5. Both Grudem and Kostenberger state that the man does not have to be married to be an elder. To support this, Kostenberger points out that Paul would be contradicting his own teachings regarding celibacy. 1 Corinthians 7 verse 8 to 10. He would also be contradicting Jesus' teaching in this regard. Matthew 19 verse 10 to 11. I have to ask, why it is so easy to point out regarding unmarried men that Paul would be contradicting his own teachings and explanations and refutations can be found and accepted. Whereas where women in the church are concerned, Grudem and others cannot even accept that there may be a possibility 
the Paul may have written the con contentious passages such as 1 Corinthians 14 verse 34 to 36 and 1 Timothy 2 verse 11 to 50 for other reasons as these passages also contradict core teachings of the Christian faith as I contend. And that because of this, and because situations and cultures change, women may also be elders in the church and ministers. Second, Jesus is alive, however. He's not dead as Adam is. And because of Jesus, we have a new name. Believers, not Jew and Gentile. Now, Jesus is the head of the church, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3, and others. God's family, Ephesians 5, verse 1. Now, Jesus runs the church as he sees fit. He gives gifts to who he wants. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12 to 14, and others. If Jesus is the head of the church, what is the church which he is head of? If men are also heads thereof, Grudem states women may not teach in power. He believes that Priscilla and Aquila taught Apollos in private. Saucy, a complementarian, asked how far the division of private and public meetings or ministries go in light of what the Bible teaches. And he also admits the possibility that the modern church and the biblical picture are not as compatible as is often put forth. Today, people attend small self churches or mega churches, church online or radio or television. Women write theological books and articles, which is used in sermons and in teaching, both in private and in public. And men learn from them. What is the church? It also doesn't matter if it's a small group together or a big group, so and thing. A group of Christians is church. And in a certain context, um, if two or three are together in God's name, he's with them. So then it's a small group. The family of whom the living head is Christ. And as all are now sons of God, any Christian whether man or woman may fill any role in the church. I put in just now the question on when two or three are in Jesus' name. I know it is in a specific context, but when are we church? That's the question. Section 4.4 Trajectory Hermeneutics and Church History. In this paper, I do not contend that the New Testament authors were moving in a trajectory toward goals which they missed, such as abolishing slavery, now women, and then homosexuality. And when we have to re we, and we have to reach these goals, Grudem says we are doing this. I contend that the church, perhaps because of tradition, negligence pride, ego, and or other, from the earliest times did not achieve to, did not adhere to, and obey what Paul and the other biblical authors wrote, which means that you what God wanted from the beginning, just as Israel did not obey God in the Old Testament. In answer to Grudem, the reformation, the abolishment of slavery, and the fall of apartheid, occurred because people challenged traditions and false teaching or false theology misinterpretations in and of the church. If the church has misinterpreted Paul's contentious passages on the role of women in the church and or his reasons for writing them, the church has to repent as in the above cases. Last. Just because I believe that the Bible teaches that women may have any role in the church does not mean I accept homosexuality as biblical. And you can also see Giles 1995. Conclusion. Section 5. 
In this argumentative paper, I evaluated Paul's theological message relating to the, whole, to the role of women in the church today, specifically relating ministers, pastors, and elders. Two highly contentious passages, 1 Timothy 2, verse 11 to 3, verse 7, and 1 Corinthians 14, verse 34 to 36, are at the center of this issue. I approach this topic from the view that the dispute actually centers on how Christians understand the meaning of and how, why Jesus did what he did, and does, and the consequences thereof. Number two, the meaning of church. What does church mean? And then three, the reason why Paul wrote the above passages. I first provided specifically chosen and ordered background information in section two over arching tenets, showing what the Jews and then the church believed and now believes on the role of women in the church, and how the church interpreted the two main passages on this issue. My argument in both section 3, Noteworthy Strengths, and section 4, Response, is that Jesus' death and resurrection fundamentally changed everything that fell under the old line from Adam, Haynes, and the old covenant with regards to believers. First, under Jesus, the firstborn of the dead, Romans 8 verse 29, all Christians are sons of God and inheritors with him. Galatians 3, verse 26 and 29. Second, we are also a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14 to 17. I argued that believers do not fall under Adam, the old, but under Jesus, the new. As Jesus is the firstborn, therefore all believers are after him. And except where sexual, sexual relations are concerned, believers' gender does not count. In the new creation. Second, Jesus, having come under the old covenant to fulfill all its requirements to complete God's salvation plan, died and consummated the new covenant. Matthew 26 verse 28. All Jesus' apostles were Jews falling under the old covenant originally. Under the new covenant, physical circumcision which require the bear, bearer to be a man, and without which the person could not hold any offices in the temple, like the religious leaders of the Jews, was replaced with all believers' hearts being circumcised. Romans 2 verse 28. This set the stage for all believers being truly one. Galatians 3 verse 28, Ephesians 1 to 3. Third, Jesus, being the firstborn of the dead, is also the living head of the church, God's family, 1 Corinthians 11, 11 verse 3 and Ephesians 5 verse 1, who renamed believers. Jesus renamed believers. There can be no other head for and of the church. Jesus runs the church as he wants, with who he wants, 1 Corinthians 12 to 14. The above is one argument from which I conclude that women can fill any role and position in the church. I still believe that Paul wrote the contentious 1 Corinthians 14 verse 34 to 36 and 1 Timothy 2 verse 11 to 15. However, I believe that he wrote them for specific reasons and conditions which does not relate to the modern church because it is not compatible to the church in Paul's time. In light of all the arguments in this paper, I believe the church has misinterpreted Paul regarding the role of women in the church and must repent. Thank you. This was the second video of the first thesis. Be well, be blessed.